Hello, my name is Rosa Tyhurst. I'm Assistant Curator at Spike Island, and thank you all for tuning in to this special Selected 11 panel discussion with River Chow, Sam Grant and Gabby Sahar, hosted by Ian Hayden-Smith and introduced by me. Spike Island is a dynamic art centre that supports, produces and presents contemporary art across an 80,000 square foot former industrial building near Bristol's Harbourside. Throughout the year, we engage the public through our diverse, through our diverse program of exhibitions and events, and we directly support artists through major new commissions, subsidized studios, and critically engaged artist development opportunities. For tonight's event, I'm going to briefly introduce the selected program and our speakers, who will then be in discussion for about 40 to 45 minutes, when they will then answer any questions from the audience. Please note, that our public programs seek to create an environment for critical and open-minded discussion. We encourage the audience to participate using the chat function in YouTube Live to write any questions or thoughts you may have throughout the event. Any aggressive, discriminatory or intolerant comments will be removed by our chat moderators in keeping with our aims to create a respectful and generative environment for everyone involved. For more information, please read our code of content, which should be in the chat now. So we're very pleased to be introducing the second of two discussions as part of this year's Selected Programme. The Selected Programme was established 11 years ago with the aims of supporting artist filmmakers to gain greater visibility and to bring new, diverse, moving image work to audiences. Each year, the artists who are short shortlisted for the Film London Jarman Award nominate artists who are earlier in their careers and from these nominations, a program is curated by Video Club and Film London Artists Moving Image Network. The artists for this year's selected program are River Chow, Sam Grant, Aidan Greenan, Katayun Jalilid Power, Roxy Rezvani, and Gabby Sahar. The full screening program with works from all artists is available to watch on demand on the Spike Island website now. And if you haven't seen it, I strongly recommend that you do before it comes down this Sunday evening. And so to this evening's speakers, River, Sam and Gabby. River Chow is a performance and moving image artist currently working and living in London. His works are deeply rooted in his past and the memories he has from his hometown, a small town by the river in Southern China. Using mourning as a method, he creates a series of self-narrative spaces to rethink the emotion of grief. And through his work, he attempts to re relieve and relive his inner sense of loss, which is rooted in a desire for tranquility and fantasy. Sam Grant is an artist based in Solihull, who primarily, pro primarily uses the mediums of photography and video to explore themes related to his own experiences with autism. His work includes abstract depictions of sensory issues, social isolation and emotional processing in an attempt to convey feelings and experiences by an individual on the spectrum to a neurotypical audience. Gabby Sahar is a French Palestinian artist based in London who works across ink painting, film and installation. Her work deconstructs the representation of queerness within public spheres to understand its wider impacts on queer consciousness and communities. Drawing on language and vulnerability as tools, they employ speculative storytelling to outline the ways in which cities serve the interest of patriarchal capitalist identities at the expense of others. They will be in conversation with Ian Hayden Smith, a writer and editor specializing in photography and the moving image who I will happily hand over to now. Thank you everyone. I should say I'm now unmuted. Um, thank you, Rosa, and welcome everyone, and welcome to our three guests. Um, before I get to them, I, I will start by saying that any of the works that I mention over the course of the next 45 minutes by these artists are available to see or to get an idea of on their individual websites. And with regards to the Q&A, um, we very much welcome any questions that you have towards the end but as the conversation is progressing if there's a specific theme or issue that you would like to ask a question on and we can integrate it into the actual discussion then please do send it earlier and we'll try our very best to to bring it on board so um welcome sam river and gabby and um perhaps the best place to start is with the beginning the genesis of your projects 
Gabby, could you start just talking about how Truth and Kinship came about? Yeah, so um, Truth and Kinship is a film that is set in Tower Hamlet's Isle of Dogs, um, Canary Wharf to be a bit more specific. Um, and this is a geographical area of London, which is kind of a victim to quite a violent wealth divides, um, where typically, and typically this is executed through the local government selling the land to um, private property investors. And this has changed the way public space is formed and how people live their lives on the island. Um, and, I was interested in how, as people, we navigate this kind of spatial contemporary chaos in a way and how we respond to this culture. So the film follows three uh, diverse uh, kind of young people as they encounter uh, kind of transactional relationships with each other in a bid to kind of secure a, a kind of mobility and st stability, so they think. Um, and the film is structured in a way where the main uh, protagonist, in a way, is a disembodied, genderless uh, narrator who is reciting a script from their diary entries. Um, and the language that's used in this kind of narrative that's used on top of the film as the sound is, comes from a space of radical vulnerability. Um, and speaks of experiences of pain, longing uh, for the characters, contrary to what's happening on screen. And by doing that, I'm trying to ask questions such as what is the politics of knowledge and conversation? Who can afford to articulate these themes? And who owns knowledge? Um, and I'm kind of interested in how the forces of uh, homogenized collective heteronormity, heteronormative identity um, has on the rest of society and the kind of social pressure this can have on queer bodies and non-conforming bodies. Uh, as this secondary in the film, the film also explores the kind of sexuality of gentrification and which bodies benefit and which don't, which are left behind. And although the relationships on screen are quite straightforward, they are kind of politically charged um, combined with the text. Uh, and for the second part of the film, we kind of see the social ladder be reversed. And within, kind of within a sphere of patriarchy, we see uh, the main patriarchal male kind of fall back into a queer subculture and how that affects uh, his identity, how it blurs his uh, actions. Um, so I guess in the film, what I'm trying to say, just sum it, I'll sum it up now, is I'm trying to collude, I guess, in the image of the young professional. And I'm trying to reference, I guess, a collective struggle amongst kind of millennial culture and young people um, that feel that they need to be a certain way to gain stability, to gain success, to kind of fragmentize parts of identity or suppress parts of identity in order to, I guess, be successful in something. Um, so yeah, that's the film in a nutshell. Uh, I won't, I'll let other people kind of speak about theirs now, and I'm sure there's time to go back into it later. So we have it. Um, thank you, Gabby. Yeah. Uh, River, um, can you tell us about River's My Hometown? Yeah, thank you, Ian. Thank you, Gabby. And my work, River is My Hometown, is filmed in my hometown, also London. So I filmed this like a, during the last year, during the pandemic, when I go back to China. So my work is always based on my anxiety and the uh, conflict between me and my hometown. And when I was trying to find out how I'm gonna use my work and how I'm gonna use my practice to release my inner anxiety and the inner sorrow. So I just trying to find a method to deal with my subject emotions. So I just trying to use mourning and use allergy as a key clue. Um, I think I, I just trying to use the scene of the grief and the song of the grief to help me to build up like a subjective language space to carry my emotions. And because I think one of my biggest references is uh, the work of Morning by Freud. 
and he claims when people are trying, uh, when people disconnected the world and people when started uh, the work of mourning, they're trying to find an uh, objective to replace the sorrow. And then why, while then find this um, ob objective and why then finish the process of work of mourning, they will see the light again. They will find the connection between the world again. So I think my work right now is is the process of mourning. And when I finish the moon, uh, when I finish the uh, morning, I think my work will be like a more uh, meaningful for like um, release my inno innocence of like a uh, loose or anxiety. So yeah, I think my work right now is therapy for me. Thank you, River. Thank you. And, and Sam, let's come to you in Final Poetic. I think you've got your microphone. Oh, you're off. There we go. So cool. Yeah, Final Poetic was actually uh, something that I did for my master's course, uh, which was about two or three years ago now. And I went up there with Ken Farrow, who, by the way, quick plug for my PhD supervisor, his film just got five stars in The Guardian. So we're all very proud of him. It's called Ultra Violence, and it is horrifying. Um, but yeah, but less horrifying is my film, Fauna Poetic. And uh, together, uh, we went out with these 3D, uh, 360 cameras, and we shot uh, the natural world up in the north of England, uh, mostly around Norfolk. In fact, there's a funny story around uh, the name of the film, Final Poetic, is that um, the module that I made it for was called the Poetic Module, and the film was going to be called Images of Norfolk or Impressions of Norfolk. I couldn't decide. But then when, um, you know, when you're saving something in Premiere Pro, you'll save it as like Final Version, Final Module, final version two and then I saved it as final poetic module and then I looked and I was like final poetic is an impossibly beautiful title and there's absolutely no way one of those rare moments where like the art just comes together by itself you know um, and in terms of the more sort of um, philosophical engagement that I did when I was making it I've always been very interested in this group called the Situationist International. Uh, they were a very fascinating group of uh, activists back in the 20th century who suggested that we could build kind of revolutionary movements through very, um, let's say, unconventional ways of resisting capitalism. Like a big thing they had was this thing that they called the drift, uh, where you would wander the city without any kind of goal for where it was you were going and I know that um, going on a walk to resist capitalism just sounds a bit silly and it is a bit silly because as you can see capitalism is still here but it turns out as an artistic practice it is quite useful because they developed into a new field that they called psychogeography and psychogeography is all about the influence that urban landscapes have on the psyche of the subject that explores them and I had a thought where I was like, well, how about I take one of those principles, uh, the urban landscape's influence on the psyche, and instead of doing things in an urban landscape, I do it in the natural world. What is an impression of Norfolk, which is why that was originally going to be the title. Uh, but as the person at the beginning said, uh, I do have autism, and a lot of my work is either directly or indirectly about autism. And one of the big ways it influences me is I have severe sensory issues. And if you want to get an impression of what that's like, uh, imagine the world as you're experiencing it, but with 10 times the intensity. Now, sometimes that can be quite a beautiful experience. You know, the, the lights are brighter, the color is more vivid. Uh, but one of the downsides of it is that the world is also quite an overwhelming place, uh, both sensorially and spiritually, you might say. Um, and at first I was a little bit guilty because what I tried to do was I tried to reshape nature to be more emblematic of an internal experience. And that felt a little bit destructive and disingenuous. Um, it almost felt like I was trying to compel the natural world to conform to my psychology, which can be quite a disgusting thing to do because nature as it presently exists is just so wondrous and miraculous uh, that doing that can almost be seen as an act of devastation. Uh, but I think the thing that changed my mind was uh, an interview that I saw with uh, Werner Herzog. And he has a great piece where uh, he talks to one of his students about how uh, it's okay for you to impose your subjectivity on a documentary. You're not just meant to be a fly on the wall because a fly on the wall perspective, that's what the security camera at Tesco does. 
like the security camera at Tesco does not impose its subjectivity because it doesn't have a subjectivity. You're a filmmaker, you have thoughts about the world, you know, and that's present in the other two artists that are here. Like um, River explores psychogeography as well because in um, their film, there is a clear contrast between the natural landscapes you see at the beginning and the urban landscapes that develop throughout. And in Gabby's film, you see a very clear way in which um, the camera arcs up and you see the city that looms over the characters as they have these sort of romantic and social interactions. And that is an imposition of their subjectivity upon the world. And and that's okay because you're an artist and that it's your job to sort of shape the world in terms of an internal image. So yeah, that is because I'm conscious of time, um, in the essence of Final Poetic. Perhaps a little bit of the essence of truth and kinship and River is my hometown. Or maybe Gabri and River are going to tell me I've got it all wrong, but um, hopefully- well, that... we're, we're, going, we're going to come back to them in a moment, but I just want to stay with you. Um, obviously you raised the subject of nature because that's the, the essence of what we, we see in your work. Um, it's also odd that you mentioned Werner Herzog because one of the things that struck me um, when I was watching your film um, is a line by Herzog. I believe it's what he's talking about, Timothy Treadwell, the main uh, Grizzly subject Man, yeah. of Grizzly Man, where Herzog places himself opposite Timothy Treadwell. Treadwell is a man who believes in the benevolence of nature and, and these lovely bears and the innocence of them, whereas Werner Herzog sees, to quote him, the overwhelming indifference of nature. Yeah. And it struck me that there was something about this in your work, almost the antithesis of what we normally expect of any kind of film uh, about nature. Um, mm -hmm. The idea that, that wildlife is, is a beautifully cultivated meadow, um, or it's a David Attenborough documentary, that everything is ordered and in its place things die, but they die in the natural way. Whereas I got this sense with your work, the way that you look at nature, that it is this place of absolute chaos. Yeah, um, well, actually, uh, the exact quote you're looking for was that um, for anyone who hasn't seen it, and I don't know if my artistic cohorts on the call with me right now have seen it, but he said the lowest common denominator of the universe was murder, which is, um, is quite a strong sentiment. Uh, I guess in a way you could say that I'm trying to find some kind of middle ground between Treadwell and Herzog because Treadwell, um, for all of his insanity, because uh, let's be honest, the, this isn't gonna be some fetishization of a man who is clearly unwell. When I say that in a sense, he had a beautiful mind. Uh, this isn't some kind of misguided attempt at me saying that a man who got himself and his girlfriend murdered by being eaten by bears was some kind of genius. Uh, clearly he wasn't. But there is something resonant about his almost, his almost childlike view of the singular perfection and unity of the universe. It, it's such a fabulous thing to see, but its problem is that it has an intrinsic naivete. Like Herzog said, in nature there are predators, like sometimes bears will actually kill their own cubs because that will cause the female bear to enter a point where it's like ready for uh, action, so to speak, once again. Um, but the thing is that I think that murder, as Herzog puts it, is a bit too ethically a loaded term. Uh, I don't know if it's the intent of the film, but it's almost like he's casting a moral judgment on the formation of the natural world. Um, there was a, a theologian whose name escapes me, who when questioned on the problem of evil, which is basically the question of um, if God exists, then why does he let bad things happen? Is that the problem is that you're seeing this from the point of view of a human subjectivity. You look at the world and see good and evil. God only sees the world. Um, and that was something what I want to bring here, that um, from my perspective, um, an individual perspective, um, the universe is fundamentally chaotic. And I wanted to capture that chaos without feeling like I was making an ethical judgment about it, which is why it's a um, near inaudible swirling morass of light and color, uh, which is beautiful, but, and I was really terrified about this because I thought it might people, make people dislike the film. Um, there's never really a point where it's obvious what it is you're meant to be looking at. Um, and hopefully that has captured something that is uh, profound to my process. Or perhaps people watch the film and just think it's a complete mess. <laughs> but um, you know what, that's, 
that's a valid response as well. Um, so hopefully that wasn't too long winded. Um, Gabby, I just want to stay with nature because perhaps of the three films, yours on the surface at least is, is something that you might say nature, but obviously there's the concept, the, the idea, the metaphorical idea of the jungle. But, but within your text, there's something I found really fascinating, this, this, this conflict that the opening description, like the, like the whole of your text, which is beautifully written, um, we have this reference to the eagle. Um, and then later on, we get, we get the River Thames being brought in. And I found it fascinating that you described it as a symbol of toxic masculinity. Um, could you talk a little more about that, please? Yeah, so the text is um, it's quite self sabotagery in a way. <laughs> so it kind of does use a lot of um, London metaphors in a way. Um, and the opening scene, I chose the eagle kind of part just because the kind of disembodied narrator looks a bit like an eagle. And I guess eagles, crows, birds kind of see a city from up high and pay no judgment on what they see of their bird's eye view. Mm. But yeah, I, um, I kind of talk about the Thames in as kind of going deeper into the waters, go as a metaphor for going deeper into kind of a self therapy, which um, plays back in itself with the narrator kind of questioning everything that's happening on the screen, which uh, articulates a struggle for these uh, different individuals forming these kinships amongst the city as well. But also, um, I don't know, I was just also fascinated by the Thames because um, I was actually, I lived on I Love Dogs and I was living in the flat where the film was shot. And, um, and I think water plays quite a strong role within the island architecture. It's like perceived as this calming, peaceful thing, um, which slowly kind of erodes at the island. And um, I kind of liked the stark contrast um, in the natural environment between this kind of the Thames, which I kind of perceive to be a very scary river. Like when I see it, I just see death. Um, and then the kind of huge skyscrapers, which are very much compacted um, in I Love Dogs itself. Um, so, yeah. So st staying with what Isle of Dogs looks like in its, in its modern form, and mm. what's fascinating is that you, the way it's shot, um, you create this world that's incredibly iconographic, and obviously we, we have a, a cinematic history there from uh, Clockwork Orange going through Beautiful Thing, mm -hmm. uh, Sally Potter's Orlando, the end of it. Um, and... It's an incredible sense of place, but, but what really got me about the way that you shot it is that you go for these harsh surfaces um, that are littered throughout the film, but you have this sense of um, what lies beneath that obviously comes to the fore in the, in the latter part of the film. Um, and I'm just curious about your thoughts of, of when you were choosing how to shoot it, what, what was going through your mind? Um, I guess for me, what was going through my mind when I was trying to shoot it was a kind of dystopia. Um, and I was quite influenced by like original, the original anime in Ghost in the Shell, the kind of 1995 version. And also books like Parable of the Sower, which describe, by Octavia Butler, which describe a kind of navigation through a dysfunctional city on the outskirts of LA and stuff. And I kind of wanted to take that kind of neo-noir film aesthetic onto the island, um, which is how I perceived it when I was living there. It's quite a, it was quite a bleak place to live, like you're consistently disorientated by the skyscrapers that move as you walk along. Um, and I am quite sensitive to surfaces and color as well, like Sam. Um, um, but also I just think that it's history, um, being one of the UK's largest trade ports based on the UK's colonial history, it was a major port for fruit and trade. Um, I felt like by filming these very wide angle shots of say glass, the river, um, a person, a shoe, it kind of felt a bit like a kind of consumer advert. Um, you were just being sold things. And I think it helped the brain, the viewer in watching the film uh, 
kind of make stark differences um, and maybe subtly not trust the content they were seeing or question a little bit further. Again, that iconography also feeds into, into the clothing being worn, this sort, of, this sort of city look. And yet, you're right, there is something about that character that we see that, yes, it kind of fits a certain type, but at the same time, it's not necessarily what we think it is. Yeah, I guess it's just colluding in that image that we're bombarded with, that's seen as success, but which is also very cliche. I guess I wanted to stretch those kind of characters we see within developed public space um, and kind of, yeah, manipulate their narratives and their lives. And within all the clothing, it's all um, very much exaggerated, like the shoes don't really fit, the blazers are too big. It's the people wearing them are far too young to wear those kind of outfits for the pressure that they should have wearing them. Um, so yeah, it's all very preppy, a little bit satirical, I would say, um, a little bit bleak as well at the same time. Yeah. Um, River, um, just thinking about the idea of the role of myth um, and particularly the role of myth and ritual in your work, um, there's a line I read by you where you talk about the desire for tranquility and fantasy. Um, and it strikes me that, again, to return to this, this theme of nature, it, that's very much inextricably linked to that, it struck me. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I really like how Gabby, how he discovered his living environment and also how Sam, like uh, he's thinking about the, the nature and the environment. For me, like, uh, yeah, I think the ritual you mentioned is quite like a super significant in my work because I also keep doing like uh, some practice about researching on ritual in the morning and about like a self landscape, um, building a landscape because I think specters in my work is super, super um, important from my perspective. And uh, because when I was like, um, also right now moved to, I, I also like uh, right now just trying to find a new place to live like across London or across the UK. And for me, really important uh, situ um, uh, uh, the situation is like, uh, I want to find some somewhere really, really close to the picture in my mind, which is you mentioned the tranquility and the fantasy. This picture is based on my growing experience in the south of China is the small town next to the river. I left my hometown uh, when I was high school and then I went to Beijing to study and then I jumped to London to study my MA. So this kind of jumping experience translated to my thinking and also my behavior. And when I'm trying to go back to my hometown, go back to my familiar, like a super fantasy and tranquility living space, I find there's like a huge conflict. I cannot come back anymore. So I have to find out like where's my hometown and how can I do with that? So when I'm trying to think about my, this kind of anxiety, um, I was like a, keep uh, searching the history, like a history of my hometown and how this kind of like a conf uh, conflict or the conservative like environment happened. So it's quite like a, a specific to my, uh, to the huge flood happened during uh, when I was born in 1998. When I was born, like uh, my mom always told me, like, son, you, you're born in a flood and you survived from a flood. You're a miracle. And, but when I was growing like in that kind of space and everywhere it's like, a, I think the, the sinking after disaster still impact the, the later generation and also my mom's generation. They're always like uh, afraid of poor, afraid of hunger. And every sinking about like a non-binary and also some, a little bit like a more avant-garde thinking for them is like a threaten. So when I have like this translated thinking or, or maybe like um, I get more like um, educated or I get a more pers different perspective or diversity perspective and then trying to bring this kind of acknowledge back to my hometown, I found this is impossible. They think my behavior and my thinking is a weapon for them. So after I left there, so I just trying to find out how I can solve this problem, how I can build up my own landscape. So there is a like a um, traditional ritual happening in my hometown It's called uh, Polite for Water. And this is like a specific uh, 
funeral ritual in my hometown is when people dead in the living in the river zone and the family and the friends gonna hold a super uh, uh, big ceremony, like inviting all of the friends to wearing like a white fabric like, and holding a ceremony next to river and like a dancing or some have some like a folk play to have some water from the river and use the water to clean the dead body, which like they can, they think you, in this way they can comfort the dead soul and to like hope they can rebirth soon. So according to this ritual, and I kind of like have thinking about how I can like connect me between, or how, how, how can I connect me, me to the, the images in my head, which is like a, um, a super quiet river little town in, in China. So the ritual for me is a, it's not a translation between life to death, it's a translation of my perspective is translates me to a specters, returns me as a revelant to the place I was living. So I think that's the um, that's how I gonna uh, handle the relationship between me and my hometown, and also the nature, and and also there's another work I made before. It's called Forest Picture, and it's like a, all about like a forest picture. I was living in uh, Beijing or London or some other city I was traveled to, because I always trying to. I, I always trying to find the connection between the images in my head. Um, just staying with, um, you mentioned your work Plead for Water, which I believe you, you had a recent performance in London. Yes. Of, of a, a, a variation of that. Um, and just thinking about chatting with Gabby just now about their attitude to, to, to sort of the, the way that the, the River Thames plays out within the film, and I'll, I'll chat with Sam about water in a moment. Um, but just thinking about Plead with, uh, for Water and, and this film, um, and I guess it's a slight variation on, on the idea of, of um, ritual and myth, but the way that you find the balance between tradition and modernity in your work, um, sort of looking back to the past, but, but finding a way to find relevance of that in the present. Could you talk about that, please? Uh, so you mean like uh, how I'm gonna find the balance between the history and uh, how I'm gonna use the concept of the revelant? Yes. Yeah, I think um, because revelant is like a, a dead soul come back to the previous life environment. And when I'm trying to like, a, yes, when I come to like, a, it, uh, when I just arrive at London, I feel like uh, River Thames is a super different culture background and also it's like a super different carrier with the river in my in my place, and in my place the river uh, the river is always means like a, the mother of, like a, uh, uh, the source of mother. But actually, people are all afraid of uh, river because the, the the flood in my hometown is like a seasonal flood. But when I try uh, when I get to like um, Thames River here, I can't find like a, people are trying to like a scare this kind of like a thinking after disaster or this kind of like a conservative thinking about afraid of hunger and afraid of poor. I find like a Thames River is more like a building up like a, a super uh, modern city and how they can like, like a doing with the business transportation. So when I try to like use the river as a, as a super important suggestion of my identity, also my name is River. So I just use the specters as a, like a concept how I gonna find a way to open the gate to come back to the old history, the old uh, my childhood memory. This happened like um, uh, two decades ago, so I think I think uh, I'm still trying to find out the method how I'm gonna deal with my set thinkings and also uh, how I gonna to use the ritual as a method to carry my. Uh, source and go back, uh, finish the work of morning, like I mentioned before. Um, Sam, thinking about the relationship between the land and the sea in, in your work, which fascinated me because it felt like there, there was a tussle at times over the course of it. Yeah, sure. Let's talk a little bit about water. And um, to do a little bit more of a, of a pluggity plug plug on my YouTube channel, there is actually a film called Water. water. It's the first experimental film I ever made. Um, and it's pretty good. I've been interviewed about it. Um, but 
Yeah, I actually want to talk more broadly about um, water as a subject within film, specifically because uh, Gabby brought up uh, Ghost in the Shell, which is one of the best movies ever made. Um, but there's one particular scene. Um, it's the best scene in the film, in my opinion. Everybody likes to talk about the assassination sequence at the beginning or the conversation between the major and the puppet master. But to me, the best scene is the one where um, the major... Uh, sails off into the middle of um, the river, which is in um, Japan. Um, I don't know which river it is. They don't give it a name. And she's struggling with identity because essentially she's um, a mass-produced machine. But like all great pieces of science fiction, uh, being a mass-produced machine is being used as an exploration of um, the human inability to develop its own subject um, subjectivity, which is also what Blade Runner is about, which is also what every... Every, which is also what Isaac Asimov's books are about. Every great work of fiction about robots is actually about people. And uh, there's this scene where she looks over and she talks about um, wanting to enter herself. And she looks at herself in the reflection of the water and then she passes into it. And as she passes into it, it creates another version of her, which she conceptualizes herself looking at. Now, I think that's really cool because, and I think it's something that's present in my film, River's film and Gabby's film. Water is a really interesting subject in cinema because when you look at its surface, hey, there's that word surfaces again. Hopefully everyone's noticing a theme developing. Um, what you see is a representation of the external world. Uh, you look at the surface of a piece of water and uh, you will see yourself and also you'll see what's around you. Um, there is this shallow reflection of um, an objective experience but then as you pass as you see yourself passing through it do you know what happens uh, you collide with the false image of yourself and then suddenly uh, the representation of the world disappears and you're submerged in something completely alien and i think there's something in that which is very reflective of why experimental film is created in the first place um, my biggest philosophical influence um, in terms of filmmaking is this guy called Stan Brackage, one of the first great experimental filmmakers. And he has this really great um, essay about what he called the untutored eye, uh, where at one point he asks, how many shades and colors are there in a field to somebody who has not learned the concept of green? And now to kind of connect that back to the water example, I think that the, um, the sort of goal of experimental film is to sort of shave away the sort of um, shallow world of objective just representation that you might see in the kind of surface of the water and sort of pass through yourself into something that is unidentifiable below the surface, but still incredibly profound. And if you want to see that visual metaphor kind of taken to its conclusion, um, again, please watch, go, if, you're only, if you're not going to watch the whole of Ghost in the Shell, just watch that scene, because it's a really beautiful reflection of like um, why I think water appears as a motif um, in our films. If you want to understand our films, you've got to watch that film. So I've got, I'm giving you some homework. <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm a little curious that someone's tuning in at this moment in time, expecting to have a Spike Island talk and suddenly realizing there's a conversation going on about an anime. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Which um, is great. It's, yeah, it's fantastic. Great. Yeah. Uh, just quickly, I do have a comment here that's coming from uh, Ricky Tarascus, um, who's relating what you're saying to Andrei Tarkovsky's film Mirror. And I don't know if you've seen it, but I wonder if you comment on that. Because again, water is a major theme in that film. Yes, it is. And I'm going to try um, really hard to just answer the question and not turn this into a filmography review yeah. of Andrei Tarkovsky. Um, what so, great like water films? Yeah, yeah. Actually, actually, um, he makes good water films generally because um, yeah. he also did an adaptation of uh, the novel Solaris. Except I think that there's a kind of philosophical elevation of that material there. But also um, another one of his films, your um, nostalgia is largely set in an empty swimming pool. Yeah. So we're starting to see that kind of um, the representation. See, I promised I wasn't going to turn this into an analysis of Tarkovsky. And like a mirror. Yeah. No, I do. Um, so the thing that was really interesting about Tarkovsky is um, he was a deeply spiritual filmmaker. And um, even if you are not a, a deist of a description as like, I'm not quite, um, he's really good at, how do I put this in a way that's gonna be not confusing to people? Okay, I've got it. 
he's really good at understanding the fact that there is um something beyond what we experience every day which is true um whether you um believe in a kind of like higher spiritual essence or you don't like for instance he has a book called sculpting in time and he's talking in it about adaptation um specifically adapting a uh, book into a film because he also adapted the book ivan's childhood into a film a film which has almost nothing to do with its subject material and stalker has almost nothing to do with roadside picnic and the way he justified that was by saying look okay imagine um you're kind of on the street and you walk past somebody and you see them and they have this incredible emotional impact on you um maybe it's a viscerally negative one you know something rubs you the wrong way or maybe it's a very positive one maybe this person is, is just so beautiful and enthralling and you just want to get to know them okay and then what i'm going to do is i'm i want to make a film about that so do what i do i film a shot of two people walking past each other and then one person looks at the other person for a bit and then walks by that does not even slightly convey the emotional content of the event so Andre said that the best thing to do would be to, instead of depicting um, the two people moving past each other, to depict an event that is nothing like two people passing each other, but has the same emotional, philosophical and spiritual content. And uh, by the way, I really think that that's something that is present in um, Rivers' film, in one particular scene where um, after we see Rivers' body sort of passed out on um, the riverbank, uh, we fade to black and we fade back in. Um, we have some very uh, intriguingly dressed young women, let's say, um, holding up a light and kind of dancing by um, the body that is now in this all black liminal space. And I think, um, hopefully I haven't misinterpreted it, but what River was trying to do was kind of cut past the sort of literality of a scene where someone is relating to a body of water and show what the internal experience of what being in a situation like that is like. I know that this isn't in any way an answer about mirror, but like I'm the kind of person who likes to use a question as a springboard to talk about something that is philosophically related to the question, but not actually an answer to it. Vic, I think it was Wittgenstein who once said that sometimes when you're asked a question, the best thing to do is to analyze or deconstruct the question instead of answering it. Um, so hopefully- it's something a lot of politicians have taken on board as well. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, just, um... I want to come to Gabby about this idea uh, that you just mentioned, something beyond um, what, what you see. And that's something I felt I got to in, in the latter part of, of your film. And thinking about an earlier film you made, 2017's The Disappearance of Gabby Sahar, and, and also having seen some of your recent ink paintings in the City Pressure that were produced mm -hmm. while you were at Space Gallery in Ilford. Um, this idea of the way that you engage with gentrification, um, of there being something more than that. And I guess this taps into what I was asking earlier about, about the surfaces um, in your film. There's the, this desire to kind of shake things up and, and to, to sort of shout at people and say, don't be obsessed with the here and now. And, and there, there's something greater than this. And we may go too far and we may destroy perhaps what there is or what there could be. Yeah, I think with all my work, I'm trying to not give one or the other solution. I'm trying to kind of stretch the middle ground. Um, and I guess I'm always interested from a kind of subconscious level, the impact that has on identity, whether that be in the ink paintings or whether that be in the films. Um, uh, we're just trying to recap on the question. There's just a lot of information. Uh, I also think that just the way I work, there's a lot of conceptual layers that kind of pile up on one and on top of another. And sometimes those conceptual layers can be at odds with each other and at odds with maybe what the character is doing on the screen or what the figure in the painting is doing in terms of its anatomy or, um, yeah, what it's doing. Uh, I think as well, I like the idea of just uh, disrupting the everyday and kind of finding an alternative perception of how we perceive everyday reality to kind of essentially raise the viewer's consciousness, awareness of um, 
maybe something that's happening in their life or their everyday experiences of maneuvering a public space. Um, so I guess the work aims to try and uh, raise someone's critical consciousness in ways sometimes. And sometimes I think you need to use hidden messages or hidden motifs um, when doing that. I guess uh, that's something as well with your river the, um, within your text, which is richly symbolic. Um, and, th and the way it interplays with the images and um, something that I hope this is not too pedestrian a query, but something that fascinates me with, with your film, and it also tips into uh, Gabby's film, is the, the sense of freedom of an art film of not having to feel pigeonholed in any way, to embrace the aesthetics of, of what one might perceive to be documentary, as well as narrative film. And that's something that I both, well, I'll talk all, about all three of you, but both your films specifically. But so River, could you talk a little bit about that, of the integration of a text with different approaches to how you film? Yeah, I think that's a really good question because I think this is also a question when I'm doing the uh, After Effects and uh, also the editing, I always thinking about like uh, also asking me the question, should I add a narrative inside and what, how difficult, how important the text is. So before I make the film, actually I don't have any script and I, I told you like um, area of my practice is also based on the desire and based on the image in my head. And every time when I film, I just like, uh, I don't have like a script or like a, a, a shooting plan. I just capture everything with my phone. And also if I find this place, for example, if I just after dinner, I just go for a walk. If I exploring something nice and I just next day in the morning, like um, I will bring the camera to there and capture that place. But the reason why I chose the morning because I really, really into some time, which is like a not fully bright and also not fully dark. I really enjoy the kind of blue hour. There's no people and it gives me a huge feeling of quiet and then i just i just capturing a lot of like this kind of images and i didn't edit at all and i just put in my like media pool and then wait for like a maybe half a year or maybe one month it can be longer and also it can be shorter it depends when i can like have like a specific images to edit it, everything um so when I trying to like uh, to editing everything together, I want to maintain the most uh, in the most subjective feelings of my film. So that's the reason why I'm not really just make a lot like a um, narrative in my film. And also, I think narrative uh, is always like a, a little bit struggling. I think a narr narrative sometimes limited me, limit me like how I can uh, explore my thinking through the film because. I think it's just like a totally like a storyline. So I'm more into like a cutting everything into piece and editing with the sound and later just editing a little bit back. So I think the, doing this way, it can maintain the most of my subjective feeling of my work. Um, I want to come to you, Gabby, about this, but I should say we're at um, 6.48. So please, if anyone has any questions, do, do send them in to us. Um, but Gabby, just dealing with that idea of, of, of not being pigeonholed, something you also do through your text is, um, is just breaking the fourth wall completely and, and bringing us on board as well. Um, so I want to know about that, but also I assume the text is the thing that came first? Or... Uh, yeah, so I basically always start by writing a text. It's very much comes from that kind of Virginia Woolf-esque space of like, internalizing the world around you and often I would just go and just I basically as part of my process even in my painting work I just do journal every day and keep a taps of how I'm conceptually feeling about these different socio-political issues or different interactions I've had um, and then that kind of turned into different chapters in which scenes were like drawn out from there um, and then that's kind of how the lineage of the film uh, uh, basically happened. But I was also thinking back about your earlier question. Um, and I was just thinking that 
Yeah, I guess I was also really influenced by just EastEnders. But I think having been exposed to EastEnders for like 25 years of my life and how the story in a soap is never actually what you perceive it to be. And there's always this kind of shock twist. I know my film is not as blunt as an EastEnders episode, but I guess it's taking a leaf from that and applying it to a kind of more art film and stuff. Um, whilst also incorporating yeah I guess this text which guides the viewer in all these crazy locations basically and I guess it's a bit like a roller coaster ride <laughs> just sit back and enjoy my film when just listen to this slightly voice which you're kind of can't really pinpoint and you're trying to work it out and it dips into different uh conflicting emotions as well in the way it's read and the way it's also very playful yeah, it is very playful. Well, I, I think in a kind of self-sabotage kind of way, it's satirical as well. And I think some of the metaphors are quite uh, quite funny, like the Thames representing a toxic masculinity. And, and there's a lot of the word I, it comes from like a space of the first person um, within a kind of, in contrast to the scenes, which kind of have a, a, a wider frame to them basically. Um, Sam, I, will, I want to come to you with this idea of narrative and, and perhaps it's my fault for being an absolute slave to narrative, but it's, it's something that my brain automatically tries to, to, to figure out, no matter what I'm watching, hearing or, um, or whatever, or reading. Um, and thinking about your film, the, the kaleidoscopic effect of it, and it's not too dissimilar to the final stages of an earlier piece of your sensory soliloquy, where you have the overlapping soundtrack of thoughts that were previously spoken in the film. And, and there was this desire in me to kind of separate them out and, and pass one from another so that I could try to figure out, even though I'd heard them before, to, di to discern this narrative. Um, so I'm just curious about this kaleidoscope effect in relation to your latest film. Yeah, in relation, in relation to everything else I'm doing. So, uh, yeah. If you're looking for storylines in anything that I do, you're going to be surely disappointed. And <laughs> I, have a, I have an academic justification for this, don't worry. So I remember um, I was watching an interview of uh, Will Self, who's a very interesting writer, uh, when, he's taught, when he's often asked about the lack of a conventional narrative structure in his novels. And he said, my life has never conformed to a narrative. And I don't know a single other person whose life has conformed to a narrative either. Every celebrity biography always feels incredibly made up because the emotional progression in terms of their career is just so perfect. Um, we don't get like three months of them like sat on the sofa watching <laughs> TV because they're not getting any opportunities during a lull in their early career. Um, no, we kind of go from like significant event to significant event to significant event. Uh, the thing that's a lot truer to the way that people actually experience life uh, is that it's kind of structureless. And I'm <laughs> sure that's probably something that um, these guys have found um, in their career, which is that actually um, the progression of your work has never really followed some kind of like obvious arc and the progression of your life has never followed an obvious arc like is anyone here where they thought they were going to be five six seven eight years ago probably not for the people in this call and probably not to the people watching um, and so that's one reason, which is that I think there's an element of emotional authenticity to not try and give it a storyline. Sensory soliloquy is more interesting because if you're into narrative, that's probably the most narrative thing I've ever done in the sense that there is a thematic arc, even if there isn't a storyline. Um, but the other reason is that, uh, and to bring it back to um, Brackage a little bit, because Brackage is my uh, biggest influence. He always um, wanted people to get rid of what he called compositional logic and uh, look at the world almost as if a child does, as um, just a bunch of elements that you haven't really projected significance onto yet. Uh, because really, th that's when you start actually exploring um, your mind. I, I think that the mind, in order to be understood, needs to be stripped bare a little bit and actually expose... Um, who knows what um, Lacan might call the real, um, this sort of like 
swirling vortex of things that have not been assigned like signs or signifiers. There is no semiotic um, organization of meaning um, when you drill down deep enough into the human psyche. Um, it's much more like um, a Pollock painting because um, Pollock's work is uh, chaotic, but he actually used to say, um, there is no chaos in what I do. And you can tell that when you look at it actually, um, for instance, uh, his paint splashes never quite reach the corners a lot of the time. So you can see a little bit of um, deliberacy there. And uh, that's what I think you find at the core of the mind when you strip it down. Um, you see um, this swirling vat of kind of entropy and madness that's just about trying not to reach the proverbial corners um, and i'm hoping i'm hoping that that is um the vibe that i have created for nature in the formation of um final poetic i almost forgot the name of my own film then um, which see that's actually part of the chaotic nature of the mind see everything i do is planned I haven't been incompetent even once. I'm I'm refusing to answer questions because I'm clever, not because I don't know the answer. I, um, I, I get the feeling you've just spent too much time reading yeah. celebrity biography um, yeah. in the last answer. <laughs> but, um, I, I, I'm aware we're we're running close to uh, time, and I've had a, a question come in asking about music and sound in each of your films, which is is a great question. So, River, perhaps we can start with you and ju just talk about your approach to to sound and music. Yeah, I think my music is really a successful part of my work, to be honest, because I find really talented a musician. He's called, he called Owen Pratt. I think uh, Gavin knows Owen Pratt, right? Yeah, I know him. Yeah, Owen Pratt is an amazing musician. Like, I really enjoy to collaborate with him. And yeah, because uh, when I start to like, uh, collaborate with, um, with uh, Owen, we spend a lot of time to like uh, have some sample and to editing and because I always try it's really hard to to try to like um, explain some abstract images transferred to the sound so it takes uh, some like uh, experimental for over as well so we just keep him following up and just trying to put it back to my images because I really have that kind of sound, especially like a belt sound in my head when I was thinking about my work. So I just trying to explain everything to Open and then finally we made it. And yeah, massive thanks to Open Pratt. And Gabby. Yeah, I actually worked with Owen Pratt's assistant. <laughs> 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 he was a student. He was also Milo, who Macintosh, I think, who um, did an amazing job and he the sound in the background before we recorded the text is just kind of a mashup of uh, different instrumental sounds that he made, uh, but was also meant to reference the kind of neo-noir kind of uh, dystopian Blade Runner-esque films. And then we recorded the sound over together, um, which is the script, um, which kind of references this, which views everything in the film as a kind of institution and, talks about the dark side of the institution and the kind of more manipulative sides to it and talks about like the city as a casino and all of these things. Um, but yeah, I always find it more safe to work towards a, a script, no matter how loose, basically. So yeah. And, and Sam, um, I know you've, you've mentioned one ex American experimental filmmaker. Um, the sound in your film, I was thinking of another, of, of James Benning, um, who often uses a different soundtrack to the one where he's recorded the image in a place, um, sometimes as a counterpoint. Um, and there can be this cacophony of, of sound that, that you face, even though you have the, the calmness of images. And I, I'm, there's that element, it struck me, watching your film that you have with the sound. I promise I'll keep this with the answer I keep short, because we've only got one more minute, and I've talked a lot today. Um, yeah, that, that was... Uh, interestingly, if you actually, um, I, I've gone in the complete opposite direction from River and Gabby because my film is barely audible if you listen to it, uh, which was a, a conscious decision. It is meant to make you feel kind of lost initially, but if you pay attention, because my whole thing was like, I wanted to go in the less obvious direction because the obvious thing, if you have sensory issues, is to make everything blaring and noisy. But I was like, actually, I'm going to make it more like how I experience the world where I have to concentrate really hard in order to make something make sense. So I actually thought, hey, for a neurotypical person, the best way to do that isn't to go loud, it's to go quiet. 
But, and um, I don't want to spoil my own film a little bit. If you noticed um, the bird chirping and wave sound effect, it's the exact same chirp and the exact same wave being played over and over again. It's, it's not dynamic. And what I wanted to kind of have that be is the sort of almost like your rubber ring in the ocean, bringing it back to the surface of water again. See, like I said, everything's planned, nothing's accidental. Um, that's the thing that kind of anchors you in the piece. It's the only thing that repeats, but you have to pay attention to find it. And um, I know I've kind of given away like the film's sort of secret there, but hopefully if someone watches it again, they'll be able to look at it with that interesting new outlook. And I'll stop it just there because I, I realize I think we're out of time. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are. We, I've got so many other questions, and I'm sure other people will be sending questions in, but unfortunately, we do have to draw this to a close. Um, the recording of the interview with three other nominated artists, Avin Greenan, Katyun Jalilapur, and Roxy Rezvani, are available to watch on the websites of both Video Club and also Nottingham Contemporary. And if you do know anyone who might be interested in this discussion, um, tell them they can watch it on the Spike Island website until Sunday evening. Um, also, you can see all six of the Chosen Artists films on the Spike Island website, on the Video Club website, and also Nottingham Contemporary. And I cannot recommend them enough. It's, it's an absolutely stunning hour of, of work. Um, thank you very much to Rose uh, and Olivia at, and everyone at Spike Island for organizing today's event. Also to Jamie Wilde at Video Club. And of course, we have to thank uh, the Arts Council of England and Film London for their continued support of events like this. But most of all, I really want to thank our three guests today, Gabby, River and Sam. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Ian. That's really nice to talk to you guys. Yeah. yeah thank you, everyone. Nice to meet you all. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.